Morning, Crystal. Good morning, Maria. Hi, Neil. Welcome. Hi. Who's that, Crystal? That was Maria. Hi, Maria. Are you doing tomorrow's Europe group meeting as well? Yes, I am. I'm looking forward to that. That's why Crystal is doing today. (laughs) Oh, right. She saved Um. me. (laughs) Hello, James. Welcome. Morning, Colin. So you'll be happy to know I'm feeling better. I should be fine tomorrow. Excellent. I will assume you will, but I did have a a saviour who offered to step in if you needed me to. Awesome. I'm in the middle of a massive SQL Server upgrade from Access. Right. Excellent. Well, I'm glad we've actually organised something perfectly for you then. Today, we have our beloved Crystal Long. Crystal has been a long-time Access MVP. She develops and teaches Access and has a couple places that you can look for her, msaccessgurus.com. There's free code, tools, videos, and articles. And she has a YouTube channel, Learn Access by Crystal, where you can find videos about other office topics too. On the forums, she can be known as Strive 4 with the number 4 piece. And she is my savior here today. I've got a, another presenter that's been wanting to present, but he can't do so until something official is done at Microsoft. So he's been going back a month, going back a month. And I am presenting tomorrow at Collins Access Europe Group. Please take it away, Crystal. Okay. So hello, everybody. It's good to be here. And I just put a couple links in the chat that have the database that I'm going to demonstrate and some CSV files you can test with, and uh, also the presentation that you're looking at right now. As you know, Access lets you link and import data in lots of different formats. But if you're just going to move the data to somewhere else, then one thing to consider with linking is it doesn't bloat your database like importing does. And I also found that linking to CSV files using queries is a lot easier with VBA than trying to link to tables. The first thing I'm going to demonstrate, now that we have the UTF-8 format, I don't know if you can see there on the bottom, but the beginning of the product ID has these odd characters and that's because it's the file is stored as UTF-8 and so what I'm going to demonstrate first is linking to a file that's in UTF-8 format and I'm going to show you how those characters get into the database and so we're going to figure out what to do to get rid of those. All the code of course is in there that I'm going to be demonstrating. We're going to browse to a file, and then we're going to run some VBA that creates the SQL statement that just links to a CSV file. You you pass it your path and file name. And then we take that SQL and make a query with it. So this is the database that you can download. And for those of you that are just joining now, maybe somebody else will repost the links for getting this database and the presentation. But first, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open this form that links one CSV file, and it does not do any corrections. So it doesn't remove spaces and special characters, and it also does not correct for UTF format. So I'll just browse and paste in the path, and I'm going to get one of these files. I'll say OK. And so now I'm just going to link, and it's done linking. So it created this query called data 2020. And when I open it up, you see these characters in the beginning. That's the UTF-8 byte order mark. 
which we don't want to have in there. So I'm going to close this query and I'm going to close this form. So this form was really just to show you what happens if you try to link to a UTF-8 file without correcting anything. Now I'm going to open this other form. Here again, I'm going to browse and I'll paste this path and I'm just going to say OK. There are actually six files in the folder, but I have this checkbox, meaning uh, for recursive, so it'll get all the files in the subfolders too. Now it's only going to look for CSV files. And then I've also got another checkbox after I link to all of those CSV files and link to them as queries. You'll notice right now I only have four queries, but after I do this, I'm going to have a lot more. It'll also import the data. Now, by that, meaning it, it actually opens up each query and it moves it to my product stat table. Oh, which I need to delete everything in there first. And sorry, I think in the database I uploaded, you'll have to do that as well. Now, one thing I forgot to do. So now I say, okay, loop and link, and it goes through kind of quickly. And when it's done, it gives you a report. It does an analysis of each query. Here's the data 2014. It called this Q link underscore data underscore 2014 because it replaced spaces with underscores and its size, the file size is 1448. And the file date time, this isn't very exciting because I created, I unzipped all these at the same time. But it does tell you the file date time in real life. The combination of the size and the date time would be a pretty good indicator as to what's a more recent file if you've got two files with the same name. Then below that, here's the name of the query that it created. And it also says it added 32 records and it didn't edit any of them. And in addition, it also tells you the fields and the data types that it found. And this report just opens automatically for you. Close this form as well. And if we just look at these queries, this looks like a linked table, but it's actually just a, a query that's linking. Now, I'm going to now this one that I did before, where I had the problems with the UTF putting the byte order mark, they're not there now because. I've corrected that. I've gone into the file, removed that by order mark. So this one that we linked initially to show you the problem is now corrected because I ran that loop and link code. We were on this form and we did the recursive, oh, analyze structure is now import. <laughs> so sorry, I took the screenshot before I changed that. And loop and link, it tells you how many files it linked to and how many queries it created. It's recursive, so there's actually six files in this folder. But I have another folder called new format, and that's where the UTF-8 files were. Well, they still are, but the byte order mark has been corrected. It creates all these queries. The first thing that happens in the code, and I'm going to show you the code in just a minute, but first I'll talk you through what it did, is when we do browse, it just gets the folder using the office file dialog. And then it takes the file name, each file name as it loops through, and it takes out the bad or unwanted characters using a VBA function and it replaces with underscores. Although it won't put two underscores in a row if there's two bad characters in a row, it only puts one underscore there. Then it opens up the file and it reads the first three characters of the file. And if they are those 
characters that I don't even know what to call them, but just we don't want them there. If the beginning of the file is your field names, it'll appear to be part of your field name. If your file doesn't have field names, it'll be in your data and it mucks things up. So we want to remove it. So there's a function in there also to open the files and remove that. Then it links to each file using a query. Now this is recursive, so we're going to also send it a parameter a recursive, meaning we want it to call itself if it finds a folder in that directory. Now I've put file pattern as a parameter, although I have not implemented it. I put it in here because it would go in here if you wanted to do like text files, but I'm only just to keep this simple focusing on CSV files. Then it documents what got imported. So in the database, there's a table called T file and there's a table called T field and there's a table called T data type. So it does an analysis after it links to the CSV file, it figures out what's in there. And then the product stat table is just the table that I'm combining everything into. And here's just a little screenshot of the report that it showed you. Ah, now when I did that, actually didn't show you the chart yet. I made a chart so that I can see, oh, did I get all the data in? And here I have a gap. So I'll close the PowerPoint slide, come back to the Access database, and come in this classic chart. Now it brought information in for two different products, and it doesn't matter what these products are, so I just product ID. That one looks okay. It looks like there's a little bad data point there, but otherwise, we don't have a big gap like we have in this one. And now when I look down at the bottom, I can see it goes for a 2016, 2017, and then it goes to 2019. So 2018, the data from 2018 is missing. So now what I can do is go back to the form for loop and link, browse, and I'm going to go to this folder, product updates, and there's one file in there, and that's the 2018 data. So I'll do loop and link again. It just brought the 2018 data in and shows the report. I'll close that, go back. And the reason I used a classic chart instead of a modern chart is because I'm using a logarithmic chart and modern charts can't do log scales, but classic charts can. So the first page that looked okay, but it was the second page that we did have a gap and now we don't. So the reason I created this is because Somebody had a situation where they got batches of data and then they were having to combine them all into one place. So that's why I created this to begin with. And that's a, a real quick demo through it. I'm going to step into the VP, VBA code here in just a minute just get, get through the rest of the PowerPoint presentation. So the last slide in this is just a little bit about me. I share code tools, articles, and videos on msaccessgurus.com. And also I have a folder on accessmvp.com. Now both of those are on Linux systems, so it's all lowercase. I just do uppercase because if you're at the main page level, it doesn't matter, but it, when you go to a path under it, it does. I post on forums, not as much now as I used to. Um, my YouTube channel, I have a bunch of 
access, mostly access videos, but some videos for some other stuff too, Excel, Word, PowerPoint. And I do training. I connect to people and we just open up their project and work on it together. On my website, actually let me, I've posted a lot of this code already. Go to articles. You can see, oh, I've been into drawing things. Lately, it's been the moon. <laughs> the moon's keeping me up at night. But for a while, I was posting the individual modules. And then these, all, these pages also have explanations. So the first one I did was how to remove this byte order mark from the beginning of the text file if it's a UTF-8 format, and then the code to correct the name, and basically you just give it a string of characters you want to replace. And you can go to any of these pages to get more information specifically about that functionality. The code to make a query, given an SQL and whatever you want to call the query, and the code to create the SQL to link to a CSV file. Actually, the order on these is uh, reversed because first you need to run this one to get the SQL, and then you can run this one to make the query, and then just get folder using the Office dialog. I have some other stuff here. That doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about today. First, I'm just going to show you the simple one that I, the simple form, and we'll go into the design view because this has the basics. Let me, I like to size my access window so that I can see access and the VBA. So I, I size them so they overlap each other. That way I can quickly go back and forth between access and the VBA code. I've got this uh, is early constant, but I'm not actually using it here. When the form is closed, I always put all the form events at the top of the module. It runs a code to release the FSO stuff. And the reason why I'm keeping that in memory is just because in a loop it's faster. So when the Browse button is clicked, it sets uh, the FSO object using this code, which will go to the definition of this. And it just creates a scripting file system object. And this is a module level variable, so it's defined at the top of the module. Here I have a is early, and um, I have a global constant just so I can set it to be early binding or late binding in one place because this constant has to be done at the top of every module that you use it. So that's why I'm setting it to my global constant where I just set it one place. So if I'm using early binding, then the FSO object is a file system object in the scripting library, and the MO file object is a scripting file, and the MO folder object is a scripting folder. But if I take off the early binding so I don't reference that, then it just defines all those as objects. It's also setting a module level variable for the database object. Here again, just to keep on using the same one. And because it's recursive, it needs to count how many files it's doing at the module level as well. So when we first start using the FSO, we just set the module level variable for the FSO object to be the file system object for scripting. And that means it also needs to be released when we're done with it. And then uh, when we're done, we also release the database object variable. 
So let me go back to the other window now. So I'm setting the FSO and now I'm getting the file. So the this is the browse button going back to the browse button. So the get file code is dimensioning the office file dialog object. And now it's setting it to three. And here I did this because I might switch to late binding. So I might remove the reference. So I like to put in here what these numbers stand for. So three is the file dialog file picker. And I'm just giving it a title, whatever was the past title. If nothing was passed, it'll just say select file. And then if the user picked something, it just goes and gets the item that they picked. Then it releases the file dialog object. So now I'll come back here. So we got a file. If we didn't pick anything, it just exits the sub. If we did pick something, it fills the text box in on the form with the file path and the file name. And then just coming back here to this form. So this is the simple one that doesn't do any corrections, which is why I'm showing it to you first, because it's simpler, although it's not maybe what you want because it doesn't correct anything. So now when we click the link button, what it does is dimension some variables and then it sets the a string variable for the path file to whatever's showing in the text box on the form. And now it's going to separate the path and the file name. So it's just doing an in string reverse looking for a backslash. And the path is what comes before the backslash and the file name is what comes after the backslash. Now the reason we need to separate it is because when we're going to create the SQL to link to the CSV file, we need it separated. I mean, we could do it there also, but I just chose to actually send parameters with the path and file separated. So now I'm going to call this get SQL, and this is takes the path and the file name and it just builds the connect string that you need. And then the SQL statement is select. I'm just doing a Q dot star because everything in that connect string, I'm just calling it Q. Here's the connect string that it builds. Now, obviously, you can put more, more parameters in, but I just did this the most simple way, this is it. It returns this SQL statement. Now I'm going to figure out from the file name, what am I going to call the query? So here I'm just going to do an in string reverse to look for a dot so I can strip off the extension. And the query name is going to be whatever uh, comes before the dot in the file name. And in this case, I'm not correcting for any bad characters that might be there. Then calling this code to make a query. So here I'll step into this. And like I often do, dimensioning a database at the module level, I'm just going to use the same database. If it's nothing, it means I don't have it set yet. Then with the database, I'm actually going to look up in the MSYS objects table. I'm going to try and see if that query name is there. And if it's not there, then we're actually going to make the query. And if it is there, then we're going to just change the SQL for the query. So we'll create a query def if we need to. But if we just want to change the SQL of a query that's already there, then we'll do it that way.
and then just refresh the query defs and refresh the database window. This wouldn't have to be done because I've done it in the make query. I repeated it here just so um, to put it in this little simple code example and then it gives you a message box that it's done linking. Now before I explain this other form that's more complicated, I'd like to know if there's any comments or questions so far. I guess I have one while people are thinking. Your illustration here is working with CSV files. Would this be a lot different if you were using like an XLSX file or would mainly the connection string be different? Obviously the connection string would be different. And even though CSV files are like labeled CSV for Excel, the reason I chose CSV to use as the example is because a lot of data is in comma separated values and they're really, really easy to link to with the query, as you can see. And if there's no header, of course, you can, you're going to specify in the connect string that it doesn't have a header. I actually didn't test that, but all of my CSV files do have headers. They don't necessarily have a CSV extension. They might have a text extension. I didn't modify the code to be able to accept a, a different file extension. And the reason is just to keep it more simple, but you can see where you'd need to go in and do that. And Teresa's asking if tab separated would be different. I think you'd have to test that. Sadly, I did not test that, but CSV means comma separated value. Okay, Neil, what's your question? Well, there's CSV files and there's CSV files. Um, CSV is one of those incredibly unstandard standards, whether or not you've got quotes between quote delimited, the uh, string variables is one of the things which varies. Another thing is how it handles quotes within strings and so on. Have you encountered problems with that? Is this just using a very a specific form of CSV format or is it using the import export specs defined in access in some way? It's not using import export specs and I and didn't test a great variety of different CSV file types. These are not quoted with quote marks around strings. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of different varieties of CSV files. Because Excel itself is very inconsistent in the way it behaves with the CSV files. I think Access works better, but the only big snag was that UTF by order mark. I actually did find some Excel solutions where they were doing all kinds of complex things. And then I just got to thinking, oh, well, it's the first three characters of the file. So all I have to do is open that file up and take those first three characters off. As long as I'm talking about that, let me come into the new format. Now, these files have had those first three characters removed. Although if I open them with Notepad and I do a file save as, now it's saying it's ANSI. They were UTF-8 before. That yeah. was creating issues. And like I said, it turned out to really be an easy way to just go in and take those first three characters off the file. There's also the ANSI stroke Unicode question mark. Does it deal with does it deal with that specifically? Or what do you mean? Well, the UTF. You, you, I think UTF-8 is like an encoded version of Unicode, which basically says that it's um, if it is a, a, a more than a, an eight but eight bit character, then it's going to encode it. That's what UTF-8 encoding is. It's like the Unix encoding of Unicode. But does this cope if it's Unicode text as opposed to ANSI text? 
I actually didn't test it with a variety of different things. What you were talking about, the UTF-8, is the, if you only have eight bytes, then the standard ASCII takes seven bytes. And so A, capital A is still 65 in Unicode, little a is still 96. You know, so the, the first eight bytes of Unicode are the same as the ASCII characters. Now, if you have uh, characters that need more than eight bytes, what UTF-8 does is it puts uh, the first character is a one instead of a zero, which means it's continued to the next byte. And it can string these bytes along to create something that takes 32 bytes. And so it's really a beautiful way of encoding. But does the does access automatically detect between an eight bit ANSI file and a sixteen bit Unicode file? I don't know. That's that's a good question. I guess that would merit some testing. Well, what you might want to do, Neil, is go get this database <laughs> and just run some other file formats through it and see what happens. Yeah, let Crystal know so she can point post some updated comments to her website. It would be interesting. We have uh, a couple other comments here. Colin also has a question, and James mentioned that using field cleanup functions to remove quotes, commas, et cetera, is always useful. Colin, do you want to ask your question? Crystal, sure. can you go back to your code window for me a second? Sure. And scroll up to where you set the database variable. Oh, okay. I think that's in a different module. Here's one place that I do it. I debated on whether or not to set a global database object for all of the whole project. And I decided not to do it that way. Set a separate one for each module where I'm using it. Right. Well, it's the one where you said, if not is nothing, whatever your variable is called. And that was what I wanted to query or uh, oh, ask okay. you about. All right. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. If That one. Right. That's fine. Right. So I'm just wondering why you bother with the, the if clause there. Why not just... If you don't want to set it globally, just set it when you need it, because if it's something else, it will overwrite. If it's nothing, it will overwrite it. Because Why bother? I'm trying to make this fast. I don't want to keep setting it. If I've already got it set, I don't want to set it again, because I might be in a loop, and so right. I want this to run quickly. Right. Well, I mean, obvious, apart from the fact I wouldn't do it in a loop anyway, I've just happened recently to have rewritten one of my speed tests i haven't updated it and the time for setting something to the current database is about a third of a millisecond i don't think it's worth worrying about and if you if you set it to db engine uh it's even faster right so it just well, it just seems a bit superfluous to me that's all well db engine also doesn't do the refreshing but I try to minimize how much I use current DB. I definitely don't want to use it in a loop. No, definitely, definitely, definitely do not use it in a loop. Right, uh, but the... this loops, this loops, this is going to go through all the files and run this code. So that's why I'm doing it here, because this could be called from a loop. Right. Why not call it outside the loop then? So. I think I, I think to make a query you want to make it generic is what you're file. saying yeah okay that's a good point Colin I'll let you know when I um, update that speed test because there's another variant that's even faster than using DB engine I know about the refresh problem with DB engine there's another variable that's even faster it takes about or oh, a twentieth of the time I mean it's all negligible anyway but it will obviously add up if it's in a loop well, I'll be curious to see those test results. Okay. Any more questions or comments? I think that was it, Crystal. Go ahead and continue. Okay. All right. 
this is the loop and link on the form that uh, it can be recursive, it can import. Actually, you know, I think I might look at the recursive thing first. This is the code that runs when that loop and link button is clicked. I like to put a list of what I'm calling at the top of my procedures if I'm if it's not, you know, just a couple lines and pretty obvious. It's recording when it starts, and the reason why it's doing this is not to time it, but also so that when you do, when it does the report, it knows to just show you the records that were created as of this date time start. And so the first thing it's doing is it's setting a counter, and it's just setting this to be zero because obviously the problem with the module level variable is if you don't set it back to zero then the next time you run it it's going to be 55 or whatever it's not going to start back at the beginning so i'll just show you real quick this is in this loop link csv module where i have all this stuff at the top and this is also the one that's recursive I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, kind of show you where it is. So just like with the easy one, it's setting the path to whatever was returned by browse. It's looking at the checkboxes for recursive and whether or not you want to import the data as well, because it doesn't necessarily import it which means it doesn't take it from the queries and consolidate it into the table where it's going. Now, I just have it going to one table just to have a simple example. It obviously could go to lots of places. Then it's setting what this date time of start is just to a text box on the form so that you can see what it is. Now it's calling this code, which I'm going to show you because this code is recursive. And those of you that haven't written recursive things before might find this really interesting, but this calls itself. Now, those of you that are old hats at this, you already know what a wonderful little trick this is. You're sending it a path, and the idea is it's going to get all the files in that path but if recursive, if we want it to be recursive, then it's also going to go get all the files in each of the subfolders that are in that path. So here's the recursive part. With my file system object, it's first going to loop through each folder in the path subfolders and set that folder path to whatever the path is of the folder, then it's going to call itself. And so you can basically go down however many folders you have. So obviously all the subfolders are going to get processed before the files. Then after it does all, all the subfolders, so you could have several instances of this little procedure running, then it's going to go through each of the files and it's going to do this process. I've, I've put comments in here so that you can look and I'll just show you real quick these, the fields table. In my case, all of my examples were the same structure. Oh, except for the 2014 data because this field name changed. It used to be PD. Oh, I guess I should show you that real quick, what it does. Um, let me find her day. Now, obviously, if we want to actually import the data, what I do in this files table is not only does it have the file name, the query name, but it also has a comma list of all the fields and the order that they're in. 
Yes, and that was so that I could use this to know which, uh, what code I'm going to use to move the data. So obviously you have to know a bit about your structure of your files you're bringing in. And this is hard coded where it'll actually be looking for this field list and it's going to first, this is the first format, it's first going to go through and it's going to see if there are records that need to be edited or updated. And now I've got a unique index on the combination of the product ID and the date time. And this date time came in as a string. So then it, it's going to just add the records. And if the records are already there, I did not do uh, the DB fail. Um, if the, I don't fail the query if some of the stuff fails. I let anything go in that wants to go in or can go in. Because I had two different formats of the data, I had to go through this two different times for each. Now here it's called per day. And in the beginning, it was just called PD. So the field names changed. So to automate this, you know, you could literally do the same process if the data was coming from a bunch of Excel spreadsheets where the, the format might be different for each one. But I did kind of want to point that out because that can be a real problem. You just have to have an example of each of the different kinds of data that you might encounter and you do it manually and then you can automate it. This field type is just storing a number here and I have this data types table that then takes this number and, and tells me all kinds of stuff about it. I have a question for you all. Have any of you run into situations where you've had to import a bunch of CSV files? And how have you handled it? I would use Power Query at this point. Okay, that's got to be Ben, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an interesting application right now that I developed for a client within this last year we actually link to a series of Excel spreadsheets and the a couple of the, well, one or two, depending upon the type of project, of the worksheets that are on those spreadsheets, that, which are project-based, the users use as a source of data entry. And then access links to those and reports on the data and that kind of thing so it's it's interesting it's the first time i've ever done that kind of a you know connected to so many excel work books <laughs> <laughs> i love connecting instead of importing i mean for one thing when you import just especially those great big excel spreadsheets your database gets huge Crystal, I'm yes. oh, sorry. You asked if anyone else does CSV uh, importing or linking. Yes, I used to do it every single day when I was still teaching. We had, I've just checked, 30 CSV files that we used to link to every night, an updated version every night, process the data, and then import it into the main database. And I've also checked they were all UTF-8. I must admit, I don't remember ever having the byte order mark problem with them but maybe we did uh, you anyway you are if you asked you, if anyone did but what's the, what was your reason yeah, for asking yeah you don't have the byte order mark if you problem if you link using tables you do have it if you link using queries and yeah, i right. looked and looked to see if there's something in the connect string i could specify where it could circumvent that and i spent about a day trying to find that and I finally just said, oh, heck, I'm just going to go take those three characters off. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I've, I've seen those characters, partly when I've been playing with changing the, the format of text files to see what UTF-8 BOM meant. Before I even knew what byte order mark was, I used to call it BOM all the time. 
but as I say, yeah, I used to do it all the time. So, but I always used to link to the table. Never used to do it the the way you're doing it. Do you just strip the three characters out of the file and then continue? That's right. I oh, and I save it. Yeah, right. so I oh. I open <clears throat> the file, and that code is there. And I also made a web page for that code, so it's explained. I actually don't know why a lot of these files are marked UTF-8. I think that might be becoming, you know, somewhat of a standard in some places, although maybe they're, it's not it's needed. Be- it's, become, so, it's because it's higher up the list of options in the drop-down on Excel Save As. <laughs> <laughs> and I did in that download, when you download the database and the CSV files, I did put another folder in there called contact with three other CSV files that I did not show you. That's just a, another variety of CSV data. So something else, Crystal, that I often do with these kind of Excel or CSV or text or whatever processing kind of tasks is set it up so that when there's data to be processed, there's a specific folder that the client puts them in, and then the form or whatever that's going to process them is set to look for all files in that folder and import them or do whatever. And then I will archive them, sometimes by date or something like that, in another folder so that they are no longer in that same folder and don't get like duplicate processed. So that's another technique that's kind of related to this that I know I use. That's a good point. And then as soon as it's done with that file, it can just move it out of that folder. Exactly. If it sees anything in there, then it knows it needs to read it in. Yep. And that also helps with things like when you've got a, a list of 10 files or 100 files and it starts through them and, and it, you know, throws up on one of them. You know, you can at least see what it's done with and maybe which one it was on when it uh, made that mistake. Exactly. This is James. Hopefully you can hear me now. Hi, having James. A, a little difficulty with multiple headsets and, you know, phones ringing uh, last time. But I, I've been doing data transformations for decades and decades, uh, you know, going back even to you know, IBM, you know, EPSIDIC and, uh, you know, images from line printers. And over the time period, you see it all. And I'm sure you guys have, you know, experienced uh, the fun with uh, these transformations from uh, various customers that, uh, or changes midstream. Um, that, you know, the customer changes their, their format, doesn't tell you. That can lead to uh, interesting results. Or using, you know, Google Docs, and they have, uh, you know, multi-user spreadsheets and and things. And you know, as, as part of the process, you know, these tools I think are critical. So, you know, you know, great job on this. You know, it, it, it's the middle of the process. Uh, you know, as everybody knows, you still have to. Um, you can't assume that the end user knows what the field really is how accurate the data is <laughs> and you know did it change meanings throughout its history all those sorts of fun things my field cleanups you know to just get rid of bad characters or corrupted file you know stuff nulls and you know unprintable characters and, and things so uh, you know everyone is different and if you can use some of these tools to automate the process and it makes your life a lot easier i mean we even you know pull in you know emails a vendor will send out you know here's a uh, a shipping file that's ready for you, or an EDI file. Tap into Outlook, you know, p- pull the data, put it in a, a folder, uh, process it, move it out of the folder, send another email that it's done. So, you know, you can you can do a lot with the whole automation process, you know, in Access. You know, as other techniques too, uh, you know, the Power BI stuff or Power uh, App stuff, and you know, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, fun with data. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Yeah, one of the the project that I actually uh, built this for, the CSV files, just you never knew what you were going to find in there. And that's why I had to do an analysis of oh, yeah. what the field names and data types were. Because even if the field name was the same, the data type wasn't necessarily the same. 
Yeah, or they change the order of the columns. So, you know, I got routines to, you know, if it's a recurring thing, go check to make sure that uh, something didn't get uh, moved about or inserted or or whatever. So it all depends it's on your user. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> How are they going to surprise me today? We also have a comment, Crystal, from Phil. I think this is in response to how you've done something similar or use CSV files. He mentions that they have an access database that imports CSV files from a SQL data warehouse. Then they use that data to manage information and do follow-ups. The SQL database allows read-only. So in order to note any issues... They move it to the access database for entry of information. It's an industry very similar to a CRM application, but for healthcare. So that's that's an interesting, you're just like adding information about an existing SQL record, essentially, but adding that information in access. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good use. A, a lot of people, I think, use access as not necessarily a real structured system, but just as a data manipulator because it's faster than Excel. And also to note, you know, he said he also, you know, wanted to add notes and, you know, with the read only problem, you wouldn't be able to do that. One thing I will comment about that um, in the SQL warehouse kind of triggers this memory for me. I have found in the past, and like he mentioned, that if you have an export from another system, a version upgrade or something like that will often change the format of the export. And that's something that you as an access consumer don't really want because you might have to adjust how you're interpreting that. So whenever possible, even if it's a read-only link, if you can link directly to the data, like if it's in a SQL database that you can get a read-only connection to. I think that's a more sure way. They don't often change like the the names of the SQL columns you're linking to. They might add more or something like that. Maybe they might delete something you need, but that's pretty rare that they do something like that. So I do find it more reliable, but there's a lot of places and, and times when you don't have access to that. Yeah, my, my point was, you know, yeah, if you can, you know, directly connect to the, the source of the data, uh, you're, you're much better off. It's when there's a middle person that's been given the task to send some data or an Excel spreadsheet out that doesn't know Excel well or, you know, like, oh, just add this or, you know, they're, they're not IT people. <laughs> they're just, the uh, you know, facilitators and things. And, and, and that's when more errors show up versus you know, a database, you know, schema change or something. Yeah, good point. Or, you know, we we also do web scraping. So, you know, I'm I'm pulling stuff off of, you know, websites and building databases. And yeah, those can change, you know, any old time. Thank you so much, Crystal, for your great presentation here today. And uh, this is really, you know, a useful topic. And I, I'm sure that people will find these tools that you've created and freely shared very useful so thank you now i've made a web page with an updated version do you want to download it it's a free tool with open source code that uses vba in an access database to link to a batch of csv files with queries the download link is in the video description along with links to get this presentation, and this database that I've been demonstrating to you. Okay, awesome. Oh, Maria, are you feeling up to a song so long? No, 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 no. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> so long, farewell, often <laughs> good night. Adieu, adieu to you and you and you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thanks for all your kind comments. Thanks, all. Thanks so much, Crystal. Thank you, Maria. Oh, and I'm looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. Hopefully, it'll go well. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.